Good afternoon to you. 306 now, News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. Coming up, Congressman Pat Fallon joins us at 3.30. A lot to talk about with him. Kyle Serafin is here at 4.30, a former FBI agent. We talked to him about the government spying on you and trying to keep doing that. And then Michael Watley, the new chairman of the RNC, is here at 5.30 today. We discuss election integrity and Donald Trump's big plan to draw Joe Biden into some debates very soon. Will it work? We'll discuss. It's all ahead. You can join us. 888-630-9625. 888-630-WMAL. OJ Simpson's dead. The White House has something to say about this. Was there any reaction from the president to OJ Simpson's death? Do you know if they ever crossed paths? If so, how, when? So I'll say this, our thoughts are with, uh, are with his families during this difficult time, obviously with his family and loved ones. Uh, and I'll say this, I know that they have asked for some privacy, uh, and so we're going to respect that. I'll just leave it there. <laughs> what is that statement? Are there any other murderers you'd like to issue words of condolence for uh, before we close out today's press conference? That's Cringe today, uh, expressing your condolences on the death of O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson has died from prostate cancer, according to a statement posted to his Twitter account by his family. That's the Twitter account in which he's routinely posted selfie videos through the last few years, normally standing on a golf course uh, and typically beginning with, hello, Twitter world. And then he just weigh in on whatever the news of the day was. It's always kind of bizarre and menacing to see these videos. We're like, hey, don't kill me or anything as I watch these. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, look, he's he's a guy whose life captivated the nation in so many ways. Uh, he was a star running back for the Buffalo Bills in the 1970s. Uh, one of the, the best to ever do it, candidly. Uh, and uh, he did a whole bunch of things. He was a, a, was a broadcaster as well, and he was also an actor, you know, uh, in The Naked Gun, he was the star, one of the stars of The Naked Gun. But the thing that everybody remembers him for, certainly of a certain age, is that he murdered Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. That's what people remember him for. And today, the media outlets are are still to this at this very late date, tumbling all over themselves, trying to figure out how to describe all of this. And uh, even the White House is saying, well, uh, condolences today to the family. Holy cow. Holy cow. It was, uh, of course, June 17th, 1994, where America watched basically in unison a low-speed chase of a white Ford Bronco carrying O.J. Simpson uh, and, and his buddy Al Cowlings, A.C. Cowlings, uh, as they were being chased by the Los Angeles Police Department. And uh, I'm telling you, I, you know, that was such a cultural moment because the whole country watched it. You know, it, they say that 95 million people, 95 million people were viewing the Bronco chase of O.J. Simpson. 95 million people. And I went back and I looked. I was like, 1994, how many people were even in the country at the time? What was the population of the United States in 1994? The answer to that is 263.4 million people. So we're talking more than a third of the country was watching in unison as this happened. And this this could not happen today. I don't think this could happen today. And certainly the way it was covered would not happen today. Could you even imagine? So, so at the time in 1994, it was game five of the NBA finals were going on. And viewers of the finals were interrupted, at least in some markets, Rockets versus Knicks, by the car chase. By the car chase. Take a listen to this. As, uh, this is the original audio back in 1994. The NBA finals are on. They interrupt their coverage to deliver you to the scene of OJ being chased by the police. Elijah one getting up in the air with room to operate as he takes this and just turns it over and down. In this first half, we will set it to NBC News. Here's Tom Brokaw. Thank you, Marvin. We are looking uh, once again at pictures of Al Cowling's cars. It makes its way along a freeway in Los Angeles in the south central part of that area. And we are told by the California Highway Patrol that O.J. Simpson is in that car holding a gun to his head. 
He has been in touch with a police highway dispatcher saying he wants to be taken to his mother. He wants to see her. Yeah, so he's on a, he's on a phone uh, uh, at the time. He's communicating with police. In fact, the, the police officer he was speaking to with some, uh, uh, with some regularity was a detective by the name of Tom Lang. Uh, who would later talk to Larry King about all of this. There's audio of the actual phone calls. Here's how he described getting in touch with O.J. Simpson in the midst of this car chase. Well, Larry, uh, we saw the the, uh, chase on television like everyone else, and I was standing at my desk, and the thought struck me, you know, we had his cell phone number. Why not do the simplest thing in the world and, and give him a phone call? And so I dialed it, and I didn't get through right away, and I dialed a second and then a third time, and to my amazement, he picked up. And we had a brief conversation, and then I lost him. And in the interim, someone ran in and hooked up a tape recorder to the phone, and I had something like five or six uh, subsequent uh, phone conversations with him. This uh, tape speaks for itself. Yeah, it certainly does. And here is the sound of Detective Tom Lang speaking with O.J. Trying, look, O.J.'s got a gun at the time, and the belief was that he was suicidal. Uh, that's certainly what uh, A.C. Callings was indicating. So he said, like, just throw the gun out of the car, O.J. Nobody's going to hurt this you. This for me. Okay, it's for you. I know that, but do it this for you. This is for me, for me. That's I know all. that. I know that, but do it for the kids, too, will you? Yeah. Thank you, your kids. Yeah. Please, just toss it out. You're scaring everybody, man. Uh, I'm not going to hurt anybody. I know you're not going to hurt anybody, but for me. I know I'm you're not, man. I'm just going to go with me. Please, you're scaring everybody, though. You're scared. Uh, just tell him I'm all sorry. You can tell him later on the day and tomorrow that I was sorry. and that I, I'm sorry that I did this to the police department. Listen, I think you should tell him yourself. Uh-huh. And I don't want to have to tell your kids that. Uh, your kids need you. I've already said goodbye to my kids. Listen, no, we're not going to say goodbye to your kids. Oh, you're going yeah. to gonna see him again. Uh-huh. You want to see him again. Please, you're scaring us. You're scaring them. Please, man. Hey, you've been a good guy, too, man. Let Thanks, me tell you, I know you're doing your job. You went I appreciate that. Right from the beginning, just saying you're doing your job. Listen. you do a good job. Okay, thank you, but there's a lot of people that love you. Yeah, just an amazing moment. Uh, so so it, this this event, again, seen by nearly 100 million Americans simultaneously. And I was just thinking, you know, this, this just would not happen these days. I mean, imagine, uh, it, certainly he was a, a big celebrity, but was he the biggest celebrity on planet Earth at the time? No, I don't think so. I mean, can you imagine if... If you were watching, say, any sports game right now and Taylor Swift was suddenly involved in some sort of high-speed police chase, would they interrupt the entire game to bring you to it? I don't think so. I mean, at this point, you would get a push notification on your phone. You'd get some sort of, like, you know, tweet or text messages. There's a million ways this would be communicated to you. But at the time, 1994, you have NBC broadcasts being interrupted and, and you're being taken away from the NBA finals to watch O.J. Simpson being chased. Uh, and And... That's what was going on. He had, ends up finally uh, getting to his house, and uh, they let him uh, go in for a time. He drank a glass of orange juice and then turned himself in uh, to the police. Uh, the trial itself, the criminal trial, quite famously, he was found not guilty, and uh, it was the source of all sorts of chaos. He had a, a high-powered defense team, including Johnny Cochran and Alan Dershowitz. In fact, uh, this moment stands out in history. Johnny Cochran. Uh, talking about a glove found at the scene, and uh, it couldn't possibly be uh, O.J.'s glove because it doesn't fit him. O.J. Simpson, in a knit cap from two blocks away, is still O.J. Simpson. It's no disguise. It's no disguise. It makes no sense. It doesn't fit. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. The man, the regular Dr. Seuss in the courtroom. Uh, the uh, Superior Court found O.J. Simpson not guilty. All right, Mr. Car- Mr. Uh, Simpson, would you please stand and face the jury? Mrs. Sup- Robertson. Superior Court of California, County of Los Angeles. In the matter of the people of the state of California versus Orenthal James Simpson, case number BA097211. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant or draw- Orenthal James Simpson not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 180. You can hear a bit of a gasp, and that OJ slumps down like just like oh my goodness, made it through, made it through. The the country watching all of this, this was all televised. Judge Lance Ito uh, became famous, had a household name uh, during all of this. Uh, also during all of this, uh, the mockery ensued because so many of the so many people all around the country were watching this, going, he murdered her. And the waiter who was dropping her glasses off at her house, he murdered him too. It's obvious to everyone. 
And uh, so, of course, the mockery ensued on places like Saturday Night Live, where Norm MacDonald would eventually be let go from the show, uh, he would later claim, for all of his O.J. Simpson jokes. Well, let's get to O.J. O.J. Simpson's lawyers say they don't want the families of Nicole Brown and Ronald Goldman in the courtroom during the trial. They're afraid the presence of the family members will just remind O.J. of how much more killing he still has to do. <laughs> Well, O.J. Simpson's lawyers stopped feuding this week, finally. The dream team, F. Lee Bailey and Robert Shapiro, were able to put aside their differences and express their admiration for each other after O.J. threatened to cut their heads off. <laughs> According to the National Transportation Safety Board, Sleepy truckers are responsible for 1,000 deaths a year. In second place, O.J. Simpson at two deaths a year. <laughs> it was revealed this week that defense lawyer Johnny Cochran once abused his first wife. In his defense, Cochran said, hey, at least I didn't kill her like some people I know. <laughs> Uh, there was a uh, West Coast uh, NBC executive who uh, was infuriated by this and was trying to get Saturday Night Live to stop doing that because he was personal friends with O.J. Simpson uh, and uh, eventually apparently led to Norm MacDonald's demise doing uh, that show. Norm MacDonald, who uh, unfortunately preceded O.J. Simpson in death, uh, also taken down by cancer. Uh, Norm MacDonald, and he had a he he was relentless, Norm. Uh, I've seen a lot of people expressing today, man, I wish Norm was still alive to see today so he could react to all of it. Uh, the best we could do is, is share some of his old jokes on the subject. Uh, here's another one of my favorites. Testimony during the final week provided some spellbinding moments. In a brilliant move during closing arguments, Simpson attorney Johnny Cochran put on the knit cap prosecutors say O.J. wore the night he committed the murders. Although O.J. may have heard his case when he suddenly blurted out, Hey, hey, easy with that. That's my lucky stabbing hat. <laughs> you want more? You, I'll do one more. One more, Norm, uh, joke. I, uh, this, this may, I don't know. Is this the all-time greatest? In his book, O.J. Simpson says that he would have taken a bullet or stood in front of a train for Nicole. Man, I'm going to tell you, that is some bad luck when the one guy who would have died for you kills you. That's probably... <laughs> You don't get worse luck than that. O.J. Simpson later uh, found guilty uh, in a civil trial, uh, libel for the deaths of uh, Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson. Uh, let's see now. Over on The View, they were noting the death of O.J. Simpson today. And, uh, of course, the real story is it's about Trump. For, for me, the tragedy was the injustice, in my opinion. Which part? Which injustice? The criminal trial. The, the fact in, that he was not found guilty. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, I but he was found liable later, yeah. yes. civilly. Like Trump is found liable for rape. Yes, he was. He was it's the same thing. <laughs> you know? Everything goes back to Trump. Um, he, he, he Until was he's guilty. gone, he was I will not rest. Liable for sexual assault. <laughs> but. <laughs> oh, uh, so Sonny Hostin actually corrected her there. I was wondering. Uh, yeah, that's. Uh, so, yeah, Joy Behar was wrong. Joy Behar doesn't even know what she's talking about. So she's trying to. Uh, you know, shoot some stray shots at Trump in the midst of the OJ conversation, uh, and she has no idea what she's talking about. He wasn't found liable for rape. I mean, the whole thing is just absurd. Even bringing Trump up, absurd. Um, you know, NPR this week has been trying to defend itself against charges that it is a completely corrupt news outlet. Uh, and they say, you know, this is after a whistleblower came out and said, yeah, they've, they've totally been corrupted by uh, the way that they filter everything through racial and political lenses and their anti-Trump bias. So you want to know how they handled the O.J. Simpson story today? You curious about that? So they uh, they quit Twitter after Elon Musk bought it. They're like, we're not staying here. We're leaving. And so they're not on X anymore. But they are using the uh, government collaborator known as Facebook uh, routinely. And on, on Facebook, Facebook created a Twitter competitor that nobody uses called Threads. I'm, I'm serious. They really did create it, and it's been failing like crazy. So much so that Mark Zuckerberg himself doesn't even post there. <laughs> it's not, it's, uh, that's what's happening. So NPR, in their breaking news item today, I swear to you this is the actual headline, breaking news, 
the football great Orenthal James Simpson, known as OJ, has died. That's <laughs> that's the whole thing. That's That was their presentation of the events of today. The football great has died and nothing else. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the left is having a normal one today. Joy Bar Behar tries to make it all about Trump. NPR, uh, once again, deceives its audience, doesn't tell them anywhere near uh, the full story on on some of the basics here. Um, hey, coming up uh, in a few minutes, we're going to have uh, Congressman Pat Fallon joining us. Uh, we're going to chat with him about uh, what's happening. The Biden administration and the Biden campaign are attacking members of Congress today who do not support Joe Biden giving away your money to uh, deadbeat Harvard Law graduates who don't want to pay back their student loans. So Biden is trying to basically say, wave a magic wand and say, hey, rich kids, you don't have to pay your student loans anymore. They, and, I'm, and I'm not joking about the wealth thing because um, the, earlier this week, the vice president, Kamala Harris, said, regardless of income, we're going to make your student loans go away. We're just going to abracadabra them. Uh, and you won't have to pay your obligations anymore despite signing all of the relevant paperwork. And, uh, of course, that money doesn't just come out of nowhere. You can't just conjure it up. It, it comes at the expense of Americans everywhere, including uh, Americans who are not of incredible means. They're going to have to pony up uh, by way of tax dollars or inflation. So that's a bad thing. So there are members of Congress who are against it. The White House today is now arguing that members of Congress who have businesses who took PPP loans from the government. You remember that when the government shut down everybody's business and then said, as a way to make you whole, we'll give you a little bit of cash. And in fact, the moment they announced it, they said, you it's not really a loan. It's, it's a grant. But uh, if you don't qualify for this thing and if you don't follow the qualifications, which are to pay your employees, if you don't meet the standards, then you're going to have to pay it back like it's a loan. So those were the terms. Well, now the White House is saying various members of Congress who took the government up on its offer of trying to make you whole after destroying your life livelihood, because you did that, you're a hypocrite. And you should be fully supporting making it so that truck drivers have to pay off Harvard Law graduate student loans. This is the insane logic of the American left. Congressman Pat Fallon, among the people the White House is attacking today, will ask him about that and so much more all ahead on the Vince Colonnais Show. Hey, good afternoon to you. 335 here, News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. Coming up on the program, FBI agent, former FBI agent Kyle Serafin is here at 430. We talked to him about the government's spying efforts. Michael Watley, the new chairman of the RNC, is here at 530. We talk election integrity and Donald Trump's debate plans. Also, his trip to Georgia yesterday, Michael Watley was there alongside the former president. You can join us at 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. The, uh, the White House is trying to, once again, ignore the courts, violate the Constitution, and forgive the student loans of Harvard Law graduates. And when I say forgive, that means take money from you and give it to them so that they don't have to pay back their obligations. And as a way to justify this, they're now attacking Republicans— whose businesses uh, depended on these emergency, quote, loans that the government put out during the government-imposed lockdowns of our country, saying that these Republicans are hypocrites for daring to say that Biden's not allowed to just give away our money for these student loans. Among the people under attack is my next guest, Congressman Pat Fallon. He represents Texas's 4th Congressional District. He's a member of the House Oversight Committee as well, and he joins us now. Sir, good to have you back with us. Vince, how are you? You're a great American. Good well, to be here. thank you very much. Uh, so this is uh, this is kind of, I don't know, it's brazen is what it is. And the White House has uh, got graphics they're posting to the Internet saying that members of Congress, to include yourself, are hypocrites for daring to take, quote, PPP loans during the pandemic while now being against, uh, you know, bribing <laughs> student loan recipients. What do you make of this? Thank you for asking me, Vince. It's sad, it's pathetic, and it's wildly inaccurate. So let's go over some differences, shall we? Um, employers, for the first time in our history as a nation, were told that we could not come to work. Our employees couldn't come to work. We couldn't have sales meeting, meetings. 
We were restricted access to our customers and our suppliers. So our business essentially ground to a halt in many cases. And then the government came and said, hey, we're going to loan money so you can make payroll so you can keep jobs. So it was a bizarre, surreal world to be in at that time. And our business took, took the loans. I thought they were loans that we're going to have to pay them back. And then they said, no, no, we're going to forgive them all. All right. Um, due to no fault of our own. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I just want to make sure because I, as I recall at the time, the, the point was – so long as a business followed all of the requirements, which is you you kept your employees employed right. and you paid them on time, so long as you met all those expectations, uh, then you wouldn't have to give any money back to the government. But if you failed to meet your obligation as right. a business, then you would have to treat it as a loan and pay it back. Yes, and we met our obligation. And instead of having to lay anybody off, we met the payroll. Uh, as, as the owner, our my income – was dramatically reduced because we didn't have much profit back then, right. you know, but the p point was surviving and we could have survived one of two ways, take the PPP or lay off employees. So our bit, you know, I sold the business now. I don't own any longer, but um, it, it survived. Now here, let's take the difference because I had, I did have a college scholarship, but I also took out some side student loans and guess what? I paid them all back to the penny when I was in my twenties. Cause I made it a priority to, to sit there and tell young people that as an adult, you can sign a loan document, promise to pay, yeah. and then when you graduate and start earning, even though on average it's only 4% of the income of people that had graduated, their, their loan payments only take up that percentage, that we're going to now just forgive it because Joe Biden's looking for free votes come November. It is absolutely – you know what? It's such a double standard that if the Democrats didn't have double standards, they'd have no standards at all. As Chris That's Plant ridiculous. coined, it's totally right. So, so on this on, on, in this case, in other words, this apples to apples comparison uh, is that you paid your student loans back, haven't taken them, uh, and meanwhile Biden is saying that his voters don't need to do that. Yeah, that, that's fine. I'm not sure if Chris Plant had got it for me or if I got it from him. We have to check the record. Oh on that. my! All right, yeah, we'll find out yeah. about that. All right, my, yeah. uh, that's funny. No, I love Chris. Listen, if he was saying it before 2020, then it's, I got it from him. But uh, yeah, it, it, the point is, it is it sets such a bad precedent. Yep. For the, particularly the person that you're forgiving the loan on, then they don't think that their actions have any consequences. They're mostly young people. They need to know that if you make a commitment, you fall through with it. Because then, furthermore, Vince, what do you think about this? What about the future students? that have paid the takeout loans. Are they going to expect that their loans are going to be forgiven? What about the folks like myself and others that took out a loan and paid them back? Yeah. What about the folks that go to trade schools or never go to college at all, never take out the loans? It's unfair that we all have to pay for these folks well, that are basically deadbeats. Well, let me just also, there's, there's also another lesson built into all of this. This is what happens every time you deal with the federal government, it could come back to haunt you. Like, like just the fact mm -hmm. that, that, you know, the government, first of all, shut down your business. And then said, the only way you can mm -hmm. keep doing this is if you take this money. You take that money under the and you and you keep the promises and the expectations that were established in the outset. And now the federal government is now using it literally against you, Congressman, that you that you did what they asked you to do in the first place. This is why the government should be not a part of your life at all, because when it is, it can come back to haunt you and bite you in a big way. Well, what did uh, Ronald Reagan say? The, the most scariest words any American can hear is, I'm from the federal government. I'm here to help. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Look, at, we've got the data sets now. They were just dead wrong. We got the data sets from California versus Florida, from Texas versus New York. And Texas and Florida did as much as they could to protect the freedoms and liberties of their citizens and their residents. And California and New York did not. They uh, infringed on liberties. And guess what? They had almost – Exactly the same instances of COVID per capita, of hospitalizations from COVID, and deaths from COVID. So clearly it proved that you might as well have just protected liberty and freedom, asked people to uh, act responsibly during a pandemic, and we, sh we would have been far better off. So the PPP loan should have never been necessary in the first place. No, not, not at all, but it, you know. It's it, and now and now this is where we are. Let me move to a, another issue with you that I, I want to know about from Congress because uh, this seems it, it's it's complicated for those of us on the outside. I want to make sure I understand it because it, I think it matters a great deal. Which is this FISA debate that's been going on mm -hmm. in Congress? Uh, you know, the, the government has been discovered to have abused its surveillance powers against American citizens hundreds of thousands of times, including people who were in the Capitol building on January sixth and even Black Lives Matter protesters. These are Americans 
participating in things domestically, and they were spied upon using a foreign spying power that the government is supposed to use on foreigners in foreign countries. Um, now yeah. it's up for reauthorization again. There's a debate on imposing a warrant requirement to, to ensure that the government just can't willy-nilly spy on Americans. And, and yesterday uh, there was a, a vote, like a rule vote yesterday that only 19 Republicans voted against. And from, from where I was sitting, it was from it was meant to those 19 Republicans were on the side of ensuring that there's a warrant requirement. What is so, going on yeah, here? If you can explain it in a way that I would understand, certainly, and certainly the audience can understand, because it seems like Congress is on the verge of just letting the government continue to spy on Americans. Fortunately, that that's not the case uh, from some, certain developments that just happened within the last few hours. So yesterday was a rule vote. And what that rule is, is to say how we're going to vote on the actual bill. Um, and, and every Democrat voted no, and 19 Republicans voted no. So then the rule failed. So the, the 19 Republicans did vote with all the Democrats. They said that they had a concern over, you know, th this uh, w the warrant situation. Yeah. Well, I would have, I, I would, I wanted to have the debate, and I wanted to see the amendments, and I was perfectly fine with the rule. And then if the amendments that I liked got passed, then I could have voted for the bill. And I might not have voted for the bill, depending on the amendment votes went. So well, the good news is this: we have. It looks like a a really good amendment that is um, going to make a reauthorization feasible and plausible to many folks like you and I that are very hesitant to. I, there's no way, by the way, Vince, that I would vote for a clean FISA, FISA renewal or reauthorization because there were too many. As you said, there were like 3.4 million U.S. person in, in some queries, and and that was just like in 2021. And then there were uh, an, an audit, an internal FBI audit, found that they had identified in two years, 2020 and 2021, more than, get this, 278,000 improper searches of U.S. persons. So no way we can not reauthorize. So what this does, the amendment's going to say, it's going to require a warrant or a court order before a query of a U.S. person under the 702 section. Uh, and essentially, it's a requirement to protect Americans' civil liberties. There are a few exceptions if there is an imminent threat um, or if somebody, of course, consents, so that's fine, or if it deals with um, severe, you know, a, a severe impact from cybersecurity. So I think it's reasonable. I think it's real world, and, it does, and it, there's 56 other protections in place to reform FISA, finally. It, but is this the bill that the Intel Committee drafted that Mike Turner's been leading? No, this one, the Judiciary Committee is the one that drafted with Jim Jordan is the one that drafted the amendment I just uh, described. OK, so because the Intel Committee bill, my impression was the, is the one that Speaker Mike Johnson supports and has been looking to advance. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that was it was trust me, it was a, it was something it was I saw it clear as fog through all the haze. But uh, also Mike Pompeo and John Ratcliffe and Devin Nunez leaned toward that because of the because but they didn't lean toward clean reauthorization. They lent to, they lent their support toward the Intel version, which was actually really close to the judiciary version, just with a couple of exceptions. So I think this amendment that will require warrants, but with uh, a few exceptions that does include imminent threat. Like we're talking about some nuclear bomb or some dirty bomb somewhere in a big city you might not have time to you sure. know, get a warrant. Yeah, if, one would assume. Know, Although every um, time every time you yeah. hear something like this, you, that your spidey senses go up because the government, in making this type of arbitrary decision, mm. what is an imminent threat, uh, often errs on the side of trampling on, on uh, civil liberties, unfortunately. Right, and, and this is, yeah, it, it, the good news is it's explicit in its uh, um, phraseology yeah. as far as what that what, what those definitions are. So this won't be abused, so, and it's also going to have fel uh, felonious penalties put in place for any further abuses. Uh, by government officials. In other words, a government official Correct. could be charged with a felony for abusing the rights of American citizens. Yeah, and if they do that, and with all the warnings, and we need to put more safeguards in, we put the safeguards in. If you want to violate that, then you're going to jail. So, so um, I don't think that they want to risk that. I, I, that's great. I, I, that's, I'm, I'm for any legislation that uh, imposes uh, criminal penalties on federal government officials who abuse their power to hurt Americans, for sure. Um, 
Uh, yesterday, uh, we talked to Congressman Matt Rosendale about this, and he indicated that the bill, the Intel Committee bill, he told us actually expand, expanded rather the spying powers of the United States government. And he said that just a clean reauthorization would be even better than the one that was being presented uh, by the Intel Committee. Is that your view as well? No, not uh, so much as I don't think a clean authorization would have been better, not at all. So I would disagree with that statement. I would agree that there was just a lot of disagreement. You know, you've got two folks that are, I, I don't sit on either of these, uh, these committees, Judiciary or Intel, but you've got some good folks that I respect that just fundamentally disagree. And yeah. one would say, hey, this is going to do X, Y, and Z. And then the other would say, no, it's not. It does not say that at all. And also not being an attorney, we had, it, there, were some, there were several head scratching moments within the conference when we met yesterday. I also went to the classified briefing as well, because I want to make a very educated decision. I think it's very important. I do want to protect the homeland. There are nefarious actors out there that want to do us harm on a mass scale, incidentally. Um, and we've got to be cognizant of that. At the same time, we can, I think we can thread the needle and do both and protect American civil liberties as well. Yeah. I mean, yeah, for, I hope so. And, but as I, as I approach each of these debates, I always err on the side of liberty with risk is preferable to safety without liberty uh, for sure, which is, I, I want to get rid of the TSA. I hate the TSA at the airport. I think it's a stupid charade that we're still doing that. Uh, but on, on this, you know, the, the votes yesterday, the 19 Republicans who voted against yesterday, uh, uh, it doesn't what you're telling me is when I see Marjorie Taylor Greene, Jim Jordan, and yourself, sir, Pat Fallon, on the side of yes yesterday, it was merely to advance the rule, but that you are all for imposing a warrant requirement here. Yeah, I would. I would not want to speak for them, but yeah, of course. And that's the thing with when you when you and I know it's complicated because it's inside baseball, but there was there was a time for like a very long period of time, 15, 20 years, where Republicans never took down a rule. You might vote against the bill itself. But you don't take down the, the, the ability to vote on uh, legislation. It, it's a very new phenomenon from what I'm told. And because I've only been here three years, I've, <laughs> I've been used to it for the last year and a half because it's happened so often. But it's a rarity. Uh, and that's why you saw all the Democrats vote against the rule because yeah. they want to sow as much chaos – as they can in a house that's controlled by Republicans. It does, though. It does, though, seem like it's meant to rattle Mike Johnson's cage and say, hey, get, get make this the right way. Like, take care of this for the American people. And and uh, I, I noticed that Speaker Johnson is going out with um, President Trump tomorrow to make a big election integrity announcement uh, that they're working together on that issue. I, I, I think as a political matter, that's not surprising. I think Mike Johnson wants to hold the base close. Uh, but is this the kind of thing when, when 19 Republicans vote against this rule, is it the kind of thing you think that gets Speaker Johnson's attention? No, I definitely think, you know, and Mike is the best, he's the most conservative and most talented speaker I think we've ever had in our history, at least in modern times. I don't want to like my, my congressional district four namesake, uh, uh, Sam Rayburn, and we're sitting in his building right now. I don't want to go all the way back there, but in the modern times, the last 50, 60 years, so I want to give him some runway to succeed. And him and President Trump are friends and they are conservative allies. And I support Mike fully because I think he's doing a sensational job in a very difficult environment. He didn't, we got to give him the runway of a full year. And now, you know, in 2024, he's getting that. And there's some tough things that are coming up. And he was all for, again, trying to thread that needle as well. And I think we've reached a successful conclusion. But Vince, you know as well as I, any member of Congress can sit there and vote no on everything and just claim that they're pure. It's a lot harder to to use your discernment to say when do you vote yes and when do you vote no. Yeah, it's such an important debate. I hope it I hope it resolves well for the American people. 100%. Congressman Pat Fallon, thank you very much, sir, for your time and your insight on all of this. Really appreciate that. As always, get into more of the details of this uh, government spying debate with Kyle Serafin coming up here in the next hour. Also, if you were a member of Congress and people in your district were shouting death to America, what would you say about that? What would you would you have trouble trying to figure out what position you're taking on the subject? Get ready. The congresswoman who represents the death to America district. She's got some things to say and they're not. I condemn it.